Hello everyone, today we talk about the reign of John Simiscus, the rise of Basil II, and the rebellions of Bardas, uh, Focus and Bardas Sclerus. Uh, we will address them also in the general Byzantine say, manual history series. This is just um, a little reflection on the events that went from the assassination of Nicephorus II in 969 to, in fact, the complete affirmation of Basil II after the rebellious turmoils of, of the first years of his reign and technically the one also of his associated um, brother that was not you know mentally fit in, in, ma in many ways but he would uh, keep associated on the throne and exactly also for that reason by the way because it was not really dangerous in, the, in that regard. We will focus first of all on the figure of uh, Zemiscus and of these other um, generals that, as we will see in this tenth the second half of the 10th century, had been emerging from the uh, far east of the uh, of the empire in uh, Anatolian, properly the Armenian, if not Georgian by some standards, uh, border, uh, that were starting to represent, in fact, a very powerful element of the empires. We have um, stressed that the, the Byzantine Empire developed mostly around the Aegean and so this coastal urban dimension which Constantinople embodies of course the, the universal power uh, to the point of essentially um, monopolizing aside from other very few centers provided with some important degree of, of autonomy chiefly Thessalonica but by scale that's basically the other only city uh, at, at a certain point especially in the following centuries that we can assess it, provided with that degree of almost um, statal autonomy um, the rest of, of the empire was um, continental and is such very different from the in fact this kind of properly Byzantine at least in the way we call in this specifics culture, because of course there were many other peoples inhabiting uh, the Roman Empire um, and the Anatolian interland was becoming ever more important because essentially it um, uh, re represented the bulk of the empire's military force, especially in this moment of revival to core of, of Europe and of the empire itself. This is where the most powerful military estates, the ones from which uh, the famed Byzantine heavy cavalry was recruited. So, of course, also with a degree of provincial autonomy, it was risky, as we will see today, for the same central power, so much that essentially a sort of Constantinopolitan army was created to counter the provincial ones uh, historically, and we will talk this, however, about in another, in another video. And uh, the death of Nicephorus II was a palace plot um, occurring uh, at a moment of essentially international theater, at least of the Byzantine strategic effort against the Near Eastern uh, Muslim powers um, that, especially in Aleppo, were gaining uh, autonomy uh, or essentially reaffirming um, the status quo after some attempts of Byzantine expansion on the Eastern frontier. Um, as buffer states uh, between the greater Abbasid um, Empire, major competitor, of course, uh, universally speaking, Constantinople, and in fact the same Byzantines. Um, and at this point, uh, December the 11th, 969, the date of Nico uh, Nicephorus' assassination, uh, the emperor was probably negotiating with the Amir of Aleppo regarding this um, terms, right, um, and de facto actually they were in favor of, with an important balance in favor of, of, of the Byzantines, but also with a semi-autonomous uh, Aleppo mm, power that was still equating to the failure of incorporating that, that region again within the empire. Um, we'll also probably see these policies in details uh, somewhere else, but as you know, the empire was essentially trying to reconquer what had been part of um, of the older empires, 
boundaries, right? Whatever had been once conquered by the Roman Empire had to be re annexated sooner or later. Um, and definitely the eastern frontier represented uh, uh, a major um, operational ground because uh, from one side there were some provincial threats posed by this local Islamic powers who were successfully countered by again the uh, this great um, aristocratic landowners in the especially in their Armenian teams and so on of, of the empire that kept um, uh, up militarily speaking also by important degree and still essentially embodying the uh, the military professionalism of a, of a real state right it was growing in power and strength and had all some broader infrastructural technical uh, superiority as well that was displayed by this, this emperors at different times right um, Nicephorus uh, was taken out by a palace coup, carried out by his wife Theophanu, um, and uh, the, the former right-hand man of the same uh, Nicephorus, that is John Semiscus. In fact, um, that came in fact from most of the, the eastern background, um, from from our from their Armeniac themes. Um, and there had been a successful commander, in fact, had been had covered important palace um, offices for the emperor. Um, and he managed to, to carry out the scoop naturally with some degree of, of risk as the imperial guards arrived actually to counter him. But he mm, ha had himself found with the severed head of Nicephorus in, in full display um, and this naturally changed uh, a lot the, the political situation for, for the same guards. Um, Zemeskis was immediately successful also because of the agitations that had um, that had been flaring in the last period of Nicephorus reign this exposed the entire system the capital to, to coups to agitations uh, as the one, in fact, that had uh, been carried out by by Zemiskis. But the broader uh, need was the one of pacification, right, of stability, um, which is what Zemiskis immediately uh, enacted, right? First, he consulted with the uh, Parakoi Malmenos, that is the uh, eunuch of court, Basil uh, Lecapenus, uh, which suggested, in fact, to, to immediately seize, uh, to, to use iron fist fundamentally against the violence since that were carried out in the city, which was a mean to assert, by way, by degree and by force, um, uh, a very uh, well welcomed um, policy by the landowners, specifically that had been the ones suffering the most from this instability and that could provide with more support in fact to the uh, to the government in, in the process um Zemiskis, uh, remitted also the earth tax in the process he increased the salaries um, of the senior officials and the title holders so he strengthened the loyalty of the hierarchy of the establishment um, and uh, he was, however, tempted to the same economical conditions of the average uh, subject, um, more than what Nicephorus had been, uh, at least. Um, there are some uh, legions, naturally, from the um, from the various historical accounts that are more or less um, partisan, etc. We know from the history of Leo the Deacon that uh, Zemiscus had to be restrained by Basil like happiness from emptying the imperial treasury because he wanted to distribute uh, op most of that wealth uh, to the poor and it's likely of course there were some measures to provide with more some political bread let's say of 
things of this kind, especially because, of course, he cared about the control of the city first and, f and foremost. Uh, the problem is that there had been a famine recently um, that had affected uh, the countryside as well. Uh, it's not that, again, the emperors cared very much about that uh, continental rural background, but it was important naturally for keeping the, the supplies satisfactory for, for the city as well. Um, so he, he, it is true that Zemiscus spent a lot um, for celebrating, for example, his triumphs in the streets. He essentially fought successfully against the Rus on the, uh, on the Danube uh, Delta uh, at Arcadiopolis. Um, he scored a very important uh, victory and uh, in the triumph in Constantinople, he had the city streets bedecked with laurel branches and clothes of gold, which, according to the aforementioned Leo the Deacon, had to symbolize a bride chamber because uh, this would essentially symbolize the emperor's role as bridegroom of the city, right? Uh, and so it was a compliment also to the general, um, the general people of Constantinople. Um, the procession was staged, by the way, to mark the international success, and with such the the importance of the military as well as essentially as a separated element, one properly controlled by the emperor, thus demonstrating. Um, according to, again, the same Leo the Deacon, um, the necessity of, of, the, of the army in a way to, to the citizens, quote, ignorant of military matters. Um, and as such, of course, all the, the, the taxes that came with uh, the necessities of maintaining uh, a large, uh, well-armed uh, force and also the necessity of the same establishment that came with that, that was fundamentally one of military leadership. Um, there is a, a beautiful piece of art that is the so-called Bamberg silk, which is commonly associated with Basil II, inserted here, but it, it may be um, commemorating this triumph. By the way, Basil II was uh, emperor, right, as uh, he was the son of Romanus II, so these were just usurpers that were in charge at the time of still essentially a continuity of with the with imperial bloodline and uh, uh, that, that would confer them, as we will see, some proper mm, legitimacy, right, also as they were de facto defending it together with, defending them, I mean, to, together with Constantinople. It was very important for John Simiscus also to um, create uh, a bond of, of trust with the former soldiers of Nikephoros Focus that had also been you know, a successful general um, in his time. And um, what, what you see in this context, of course, is that the army followed those who could maintain their prerogatives um, and so on. And there is a tendency that will be stamped uh, attentively by Basil II in kind of avoiding the in fact the the rise of this great private landlords. Um, it was a bit the policy of the Macedonian dynasty that emerging after the the early Middle Ages um, tried to to, to uh, keep up with that the older style kind of peasant soldiery model right, that. Um, was being eroded by the great, um, the great aristocrats in, in the country, but the fact that the bulk of the military was already supplied by some greater power and was a competition between the state, so whoever ruled from Constantinople, and this, and of course its administrative branches, but also the the private power of the of the rural uh, landlords that course had their own power in the same city as they were aiming fundamentally at its control. Um, for, for, for winning 
the the moral support of, of the soldiers, John Samiscus launched some uh, spectacular campaigns against the Islamic Near East uh, from the autumn of 972, so with a prospect of successful conquest and thus uh, donatives to, to, to the army and you know some greater stability of the empire, so more regular salaries, etc. And these campaigns uh, will deserve uh, another a, a bit on their own because they managed essentially to reach Jerusalem after having conquered uh, an important deal of cities, um, including Damascus, Beirut, um, and uh, the Byzantine propaganda in 974 even claimed that the imperial army had arrived to Baghdad uh, itself. Right, most of these conquests were directed at the Mediterranean uh, coastline um, that naturally was uh, the most important target but still there was uh, an Abbasid Caliphate in fact based in, uh, in Mesopotamia that could pressure these conquests by pushing westwards and we know surely that the Byzantines levied a tribute uh, under John Zemiscus from the Amir of Mosul, so east uh, enough, right? In 975, Zemiscus arrived in Damascus, uh, took Beirut uh, by storm after having uh, lev uh, levied tribute from Syria. Um, and in the process, as it was just in the Byzantine custom, there were lots of relics that were sent back to Constantinople, like it would happen during the Crusades, right? These were some, you know, the, the the most important places um, in uh, in antiquity at the time, also of the of, of early Christianity, there was a great, um, uh, of course, ecclesiastical tradition locally. Of course, uh, the Christian Church still existing, thriving even in the in under the Islamic um, under Islamic government, um, and this was naturally a, a foreign invasion at that point as we will see some some Christians were also supporting the Muslims obviously this is also what brought um, you know the, to the deportation of the Paulicians in the Balkans uh, that gave um, fuel extra fuel to eventually the Bogomil uh, activity later on in the same places as fringe uh, that were supported by the Abbasids in an anti um, orthodox uh, function, as you understand. So sending back the relics of the great um, Christian past to Constantinople was one of the greatest um, feats of any uh, Roman emperor since the new Rome was um, created, if you want, by adding to this otherwise previous lack of any, basically of any apostolic tradition to, to Byzantium, to to stress again the power of the city and the, the new center of the universe. Um, the same Nicephorus II had sent relics back to the capital after several of his campaigns. Um, and in a letter to Ashot III, uh, was the king of kings of Bagrat, Armenia, Tsemiscus even claimed to have received tribute from Ramla. Jerusalem and other towns. Uh, the ultimate goal of, of the empire was, of course, the recapture of Jerusalem, just like it was for the Western Christians with the Crusades eventually. Um, but in this, at least, um, uh, Tzimiscus failed, probably. I mean, the, the, the results of the campaign were, were extraordinary, so it was just a, 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 a big success. But probably there was no way to to crown that with the conquest uh, of Jerusalem. In any case, the empire had itself felt heavily in the Levant, and this also worried further the um, the declining, actually, uh, Abbasid Caliphate. Um, and naturally, the propaganda was quite um, normal in, in all times, and it was used for mostly internal consumption, but also for the aforementioned Caucasus, where 
the Byzantine effort as you know so Basil the second was main aimed in part to uh, to push further in fact the imperial boundaries uh, on essentially the uh, the Euphrates uh, valley right and opening that's a in that sense a channel to, to attack the, the heart uh, of the caliphate uh, naturally most of that frontier would, would remain um, decentralized but it was still essentially a co-opting system, right? The Armenian princes were politically still floating fundamentally between mostly the Byzantine world, of course, also as Christians, but the the Abbasid one, because they didn't want to be subjugated fundamentally by any of the two, so the stronger would be countered by the other in some way. They were essentially a feudal world, so they were split in different parties. And generals like Zemiscus, and uh, Sclerus, as we'll see, were pretty, um, pretty close to that. Well, they knew it. Um, they they came from there, um, and they they knew essentially what language they they could speak mm, politically and culturally with with these um, noblemen to to win them over. Um, this operation was particularly successful. Semiscus designs on Armenia, however, uh, didn't have the time for fruition as uh, the emperor died on January the 11th, 976. We don't know whether out of typhoid or poison, by the way. Um, it's likely that he would have waged at that point a campaign in Armenia hadn't he died but so so it went so at this point the elder son of Romanus the second Basil was 17 right approaching mm, properly the the say he was already an adult by those time standards but struggling in this dangerous moment after all because the men like Phocas and Smiscus were particularly powerful so they the Imperial bloodline had to be quite careful with what um, you know these people had in mind. They were also intermarried, but I mean we're talking about the legitimate heirs and the legitimate legitimate emperors, the Porphyrogenitoi. Um, and at this point, in fact, uh, no formal regency of the the kind that had existed up to this point on Basil and his brother were were required, right? Um, uh, there was still uh, Basil's great grandfather's bastard son was Basil uh, Lecapenus, the Paracoi Momenus, the, the court eunuch, um, that for this reason would be maintained at the head of the imperial administration uh, for 10 years to come. So, after you know, all the, uh, that's exactly why eunuchs were entrusted with these tasks because they couldn't um, inspire to imperial um, to the imperial throne due to their physical unfitness um, and there is this moment of accession of Basil II properly to to power right I made a couple of videos about Basil and his reign but never told uh, well actually yes one is in general almost manualistic in cut but we have to look at different other times I made um, of, uh, of his reign. I made one about the sustainability of, of the military expansion. As you know, Basil was one of the sing single most successful um, commanders in Byzantine history. He dramatically enlarged uh, the empire's boundaries. He, he crushed Bulga the, the first Bulgarian empire, etc. Um, but also, and famously enough, he was essentially uneducated for the time standards. Like, Byzantine emperors, aside from their personal inclinations, were normally um, educated in a very particular way, right? The imperial um, uh, court rituals were very strict. Um, there was all a, a particular etiquette. The same emperors probably had embodied in that kind of divine order and perfection. Basil had kind of kind of missed this and he was just by inclination a soldier, right? That's also he wanted to, to be represented. He had in fact a rather Spartan life. He he wore poorly. 
and all this thing and he, he couldn't even speak well as a true um, uh, at least this, there's this phrase by Michael Sellers in his famous chronography it says kai agroi kikos malon e eleuterios that is to say he would speak more li like a peasant than uh, say eleuterios here it would be like a gentleman but in the sense still in the, still in the Byzantine sense that every uh, that a free man because that's what the term means really is right so this gives us an interesting cut of Byzantine mindset because essentially peasants weren't you see at uh, the, the 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 aristocratization of the establishment in a quasi feudal way to the point that yes in theory everybody is free like in ancient times in the empire but de facto right this is not the case like a peasant is not uh, considered like a free man and in greek that sense deleuterius is it it, it, it say embraces freedom at, at the higher level one of in fact was the, the the noble one of the ancient world um turns both in this moment so um this um was uh, surely a uh, some sort of novelty especially considering that basil's ancestors was particularly cultured um for even for imperial standards um and um basil was as we've just said more interested in military drill formations um he was in fact much more similar paradoxically to whom Nikephor's focus had been was a sort of another celibate ascetic. In fact, Basil also believed, um, you know, without even caring about the fame of this this kind of issues, but mostly just as, as a commander, as a as a protector of Constantinople, as we will see now, um, a war leader, right? Uh, um, a role that he took on since early uh, adulthood, and that he cultivated throughout the rest of his life. Um, and in a famous Psalter, he is depicted in military uniform, properly on the frontispiece. Um, there are opposite verses explaining such images as the Archangel Michael handling Basil a spear, right? Um, you can see in the um, Greek Code 17 at uh, the Martian Library of Venice, this, this representation. And there is, of course, the nickname of Bulgar Slayer that actually in, in St. Basil's time was not um, considered like a real compliment. And there is some controversy regarding whether this, this um, uh, because the, the, the true excellent name was Porphyrogenitus, right? So Bulgar Slayer was surely a nickname was attributed to him but it was not just like an official titling and some people say well but it was written on his tomb at least we have some verses that are kind of um meaningful still about how he regarded on the same epithet his his vision it says u gartis eiden eremon emon dori al agripnon apantatozoes chronon romes ta technates neas erio which means no one saw my spear lie still it's something almost homeric um, of course and but I was wakeful through all the time of my life and guarded the children of the new Rome so of course a um, properly a, 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 the, 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 the vicar of Christ in that sense as properly the father the protector of of humanity the new Rome and her universal empire but as we'll see with children so somehow subject and this is interesting because we don't have to think that Basil II just fought for you know civic modern idealistic reasons about for, for maintaining alive the, the backbone of the uh, peasant soldiery in the Byzantine army he did so because mostly wanted to counter again competitors to imperial power but not that those differences in socially speaking weren't considered of course um, and in fact there was a pretty brutal political game 
behind this all. Um, Basil was concerned as much, uh, if not at some point more, of his subjects and even officers than his foreign enemies. Um, as you know, Basil would spend a great part of his life fighting the Bulgarians that had already been somehow pounded by the Byzantines before Basil II and therefore were pretty resentful about it as their empire was basically you know crumbling at least in a, in a startled sense you know we made a video about the first Bulgarian Empire was also there an enormous effort to try to, to centralize right uh, from essentially a a, a, a tribal starting point and uh, the, the, um, the 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 Tsars pursued a uh, an imitative in fact policy to the one of Constantinople trying to become ever closer in that also in ecclesiastical administration and so on and of course uh, these two states were too close not to essentially interfere constantly on each other and so the conflict would remain in, in many ways but the interesting thing is that, of course, there was a Byzantine military presence in Bulgaria by some degree, at least on the frontier, and th there was a lot of uh, hybrid and intertwinement between the Byzantine officers and the local Bulgarians. And, in fact, um, four sons of an Armenian officer in the Byzantine occupation army of Bulgaria began to act, uh, you know, on their own, um, unloyally to the empire and kind of riding the wave of Bulgarian resentment against Constantinople. Uh, soon after Tsimiskas' death, if not even before, these um, Kometopouloi, um, so literally the sons of the Comets, so this uh, de facto, like like in the West would have just called them somehow vassals in a way, but these, the, as you know, the Byzantine reality was a bit l less private in nature. In any case, there was a sort of dynastic in installment, also locally speaking, properly deserted the imperial army and not just joining but leading the Bulgarian rebels because they were powerful people, they had connections, they were rich and they could also co-opt some uh, Bulgarian chiefs out on their own. Um, this naturally threatened the stability of the Bulgarian frontier um, and the same imperial eastern army revolted within months of Tsimiskas' death. Meanwhile, the new claimant to the imperial throne, at least administratively, was Bardas Sclerus, the same way, again, leaving Basil and his brother in charge, but the fact of taking control uh, of the government. And uh, Sclerus had been uh, practically the general that had won the Battle of Arcadiopolis on the Rus, um, on the, um, uh, for, for Tsimiskas. And he was used to quash the rebellion of Bardas Phokas, that was the nephew of Nicephorus in 970. Scleros also was of Armenian um, um, origin and um, he um, essentially came to, uh, to con towards Constantinople with actually a much more than just a political negotiation in arms, right? He forced the Taurus mountain passes after further battles, he gradually closed on Constantinople, right? He arrived properly on the Bosphorus um, at Uskodar. And Basil Lecapenos, the Parakoimomenos, turned uh, at that point to the same Bardas Phokas uh, for essentially leading the army against the rebel. The troops that Phokas mastered uh, in his family heartland around uh, Caesarea, that is Mazaka in Cappadocia, uh, 
Phocas was twice defeated in the summer and autumn, respectively, of 978. At that point, uh, the Macedonians um, in the, the imperial dynasty uh, were in, in trouble because Sclerus uh, was marching straight towards Constantinople. And uh, after this opposition, naturally, the, the reaction against the, the, imper uh, the imperial household could be much less kind of um, civile, right? And definitely not just about power sharing. Um, at this point, it was the Georgian prince David Kuropalatus with um, 12,000 cavalry army uh, straight from in fact his uh, homeland to rush in aid of, of Constantinople. Uh, David Kuropalatus um, came from um, from the area of Taltaik um, right um, essentially Theodosiopolis the, and uh, represents the degree, as we were saying before, of hybrid on, on the frontier that could bring this Georgian uh, ruler, essentially, in a greater light in the face of, of, of the Macedonian or legitimate imperial dynasty. Um, and the Georgians uh, joined with the remnant of, of a focus army that had managed to, to, to retreat intact but severely depleted after the defeats in Anatolia. And they uh, managed together, however, to defeat Sclerus west of the same Caesarea in the theme of Carciana on March the 24th, 979. The story is picturesque because it seems that Bardas Sclerus and Bardas Focus fought um, a duel during the battle. Uh, in any case, Sclerus was in fact defeated and managed to survive, escaping uh, to Islamic territory, by the way, um, and specifically under Abbasid protection, for which also there were lengthy negotiations between Constantinople and Baghdad about what had happened. Naturally, Sclerus had been supported by some by 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 the, the caliphal forces in, in in the process, or at least you know he had been provided with, with some aid, were some Islamic troops under his control, just from the the rebel frontier um, that um, included a hybrid with the Muslim troops as well. Uh, Sclerus was eventually to return again as a claimant to the throne um, and not being betrayed in this sense by, by the Abbasids that saw him as a suitable political pawn to launch against Constantinople. Now in 985 uh, Basil managed to get rid of this great uh, figure of 10th century Byzantine politics, his relative Basil the Paricon Mominus, and he literally exiled him from the city because he was suspected to have plotted with various generals of the Eastern Army to overthrow the same Basil II. As a consequence, the Emperor thought well to take control of the army himself, which, as we've seen, was what he was longing to do, and that politics at this point had prevented him doing given that the generals would have not been happy of this interference so this was a good chance to uh, get rid of some problems by being finally in charge of 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 the army the core of the army um, of constantinople um, itself um, and this naturally in fact was done in in opposition politically and also military um, to the great families of the southeastern borders. As we've seen, Bulgaria presented an important, mm, say, 
theater of operations because um, from one side um, the Bulgarian Empire was a threat right uh, in 985 and early 986 uh, the uh, Tsar Samuel um, emerged as the dominant cometopolis of uh, probably also the Byzantine held territory and as such with the support of the Reb also some rebel Byzantine generals, as we've seen, was uh, essentially taking control and in part dismantling important forts and towns in Thrace and northern Greece to facilitate um, incursions, future incursions and raids in, in the heart of, of, of the Byzantine Empire. Uh, Samuel also deported the inhabitants of Larissa to Bulgaria to strengthen the uh, labor force and, and manpower of his uh, land at the expense of the Byzantines. In fact, many males of these communities were, were hired for military service under the Tsar. Basil, at this point, um, attacked um, with a large force Serdica, today's Sofia, that was already at the time a key strategic center, but he failed. Uh, the town resisted. The Byzantine army was actually ambushed. That uh, was a bit like the norm in the Balkan interland, given that, again, the Byzantines were the stronger military, but for this reason, guerrilla and, you know, knowledge of terrain, etc., would always pose dramatic, say, unconventional threats to imperial forces. Um, and this, uh, uh, in fact, defeat occurred at the crossing of Trajan's gates, and uh, quite a strategic choke, choke point. Um, and the, the Bulgarians were suc uh, successful. Basil himself barely escaped. So this was a first taste of real war for the young, what would have become the, the Bulgar Octonus, as a matter of fact, and he would learn, as any general basically does, is not born taught, let's say. Um, and uh, it was naturally a heavy blow for, for the young emperor, morally speaking, because, you know, he was especially so, um, so, you know, in love with military life that such beginning was somehow ignominious and you know people had died the name of the empire had been um, obscured and so on and it, it is in fact in this moment of Basil's political weakness that Bardas Sclerus seized the opportunity to uh, negotiate his release with the Abbasid authorities in Baghdad and to be in fact, uh, finance, support, armed for an expedition against the same Constantinople in, in early 987 with, with, a, with a purpose of regime change. On August the 15th, 987, Bardas Focus, uh, that as we've seen, Basil had already turned for assistance against Sclerus, um, was himself proclaimed emperor right um in with the help of malenus and other cappadocian um, aristocrats he managed to raise local troops strengthening the tagmata under his command um and a pact was negotiated between bardas clarus and bardas focus for sharing part of, of the eastern frontier, essentially in the face uh, against Basil. Uh, that was the actual point, right? Um, Sclerus would get Antioch um, with other kind of newly conquered, the newly conquered territories from, from the campaign of John Simiscus. And as we've seen, Sclerus had already drawn troops um, from those areas in the, the first coup. And um, Thus, uh, properly important territories south and east uh, of, uh, of Antioch herself 
and by the end, uh, so they shared power, uh, Cappadocia fundamentally and, and Syria, uh, um, and other actually areas for 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 focus in more in, in this Byzantine uh, Anatolian East. By the end of 987, Focus had uh, gained control actually of most of Anatolia as such. Thus, he sent some troops uh, to uh, Chrysopolis, this today's Uskadar, so literally in front of Constantinople, because it's just today Uskadar is just a, a quarter of Istanbul, except from the other side of, from, of, of the Bosphorus on the Asian part. Right, so the, the rebel had arrived that close to, to Basel, um, and this, um, this position had already actually been seized by Leo Focus back in 919 during those kind of uh, usurpations that, that, you know, the, fo the, the, the Focus were some of the, were essentially the, basically the most powerful family in the Byzantine Empire after, in the, like in Macedonian times, after, f after the Emperor. So they had always kind of attempted this kind of uh, coups. And in the process, Bardas Focus kept troops ready to, say, to, to, to concern, uh, to, to, to threaten Constantinople by s a certain degree, while he would lay siege to Abydos, uh, that is essentially on, on the Dardanelles, so closing the, the Marmara Sea for, for, for the, to the imperial uh, power and hoping to, to cross into Europe uh, at some point. Um, at this point, some um, some factors played in favor of Basil II, almost divine ones, right? Imperial authority triumphing by by divine uh, will, right? And the the propaganda exploited this because, of course, it was important to stress, as we've seen, that it was the imperial guidance as opposed to the actually to to the army itself that would just essentially at his command would make the difference. Barangian troops arrived uh, in support of Basil from Kiev, given that uh, the emperor had successfully negotiated uh, a marriage between his own sister, Anna Porfirogenita, and the ruler of the Rus, Vladimir, son of Sviatoslav. Um, and uh, this would also entail further steps for the Christianization of the Rus and the ever greater incorporation in the, say, moral, cultural, intellectual sphere of, of, uh, of Constantinople. Uh, in return for Anna's hand, Vladimir um, sent this contingent of 6,000 men which arrived in Constantinople to, to guard it, and more, because basically they managed to cross by surprise the Bosphorus and um, routing Barda's force encamped in Chrysopolis. Um, so the importance also of amphibious operations with this Byzantine and Russian combined uh, you know, knowledge, uh, n know-how was definitely uh, paying off. Um, and um, the interesting aspect of this too uh, is that these forces were mostly infantry, right? And uh, the, the situation was desperate enough because if the heavy cavalry of the rebel army from the eastern teams that was quite strong had had the the possibility of of maneuvering or not being caught by surprise being deployed successfully they they would have been uh the they would have been victorious against uh basil and in 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 this uh in fact it was a further stroke of fortune literally when bardas uh focus 
uh, came to fight against the same Basil, and allegedly in the climatic battle on April the 13th, 989, uh, Focus died of an actual stroke. And it, in in the moment in which the the two were challenging each other in single combat, which as we've seen was was a thing, still among. Uh, the same thing had been done by with, b with between Focus and Sclerus and so on. As a consequence, the uh, the Focus army without his leader d disbanded, and this threat was averted. Bardas Sclerus at this point reemerged to make a common cause with the re uh, the, the leaderless rebels. And also with uh, Focus sons that were still in command of them. And again, let's stress this, this aspect of the private power of these eastern, almost feudal forces from, from Anatolia. In June, Sclerus wrote to Baghdad asking the mm, Turkic general, who was essentially controlling the city, as you know, already at that point, the Gulam's hand. Um, you know, well, even before the Seljuks were in control of, of the caliphate, requesting troops, right? And there was, however, no interference from Baghdad, um, and as a consequence, Sclerus was forced to negotiate with Constantinople. Basil granted Sclerus an amnesty in the autumn 989. Um, the man would essentially, in fact, uh, remain in exile. Uh, Basil, once uh, on the way of one of his um, Bulgarian campaigns, actually visited and paid homage to him in a, you know, political sense, uh, even appointing him as Kuropalatus. The man would die several years later, so uh, naturally, by the way, which was rare, given and the times, and especially what kind of role he had had, but uh, his one is, is an interesting story. These were all valiant generals. There was probably also some important respect attributed to, to the figures, and um, and of course the most politically opportunistic reasons for doing so as well. Um, and um, as a consequence, also without Sclerus, uh, the remaining rebels were forced to to accept Basil's suzerainty. And especially so, the city of Antioch, that was still garrisoned since Sclerus and Focus times, um, by, in fact, Focus forces, and specifically by his son Leo, thus making Syria, at least the most important city in the region, again, under under Constantinople, or at least Basil's government, again. Right. So this was a, a very important phase because, um, especially at the Battle of Chrysopolis, everything could be reversed in a way. So you see a, a very shrewd planning uh, setbacks, uh, Basil being defeated first in Bulgaria, but managing to secure the, uh, the Russian aid, also because the Kievans, frankly, didn't uh, look upon with great, um, with great um, sympathy the strengthening of a Bulgarian power, even though they could, of course, exploit the general mm, situation, even to side with them at some point. And Vladimir's father, as we've seen, had invaded the same Danubian Delta, uh, say, in, in anti-Byzantine fashion, etc. So also the 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 relations with the Russians were being normalized in a more kind of rational political international order. Um, it was very prestigious, first of all, for for the Russians to for the Russian uh, prince, great prince, to to marry a Porphyrogenita. That was the point. Right? Th these were the same generations in which the the Ottonians were, you know, being triggered. Uh, to death, like in those memes, uh, with a guy crying because you know the Byzantines didn't want in 
any possible way to give a Porphyrogenita princess in spose to the uh, to the to the Western emperors, right? That they recognized as emperors actually themselves in Constantinople, but not as Roman, of course. And so they didn't want to create some kind of dynastic um, precedent. You know, Teofano had been married with Otto II, and she was the mother of Otto III. And there was a lot of Byzantine mystique there uh, in, in the West about it. But um, Teofano was just the you know, secondary relative of, of an usurper. So this was very different from the blood of the Macedonian dynasty. So the Russian marriage was very, very important um, in that regard. And it tells you also a bit how desperate the situation was in Constantinople for Basil. And you realize how important it was affirming Constantinople's rule over these eastern rebels that were incarnating the top military quality of the empire, right? So still, um, there was, uh, again, a, an external aid uh, for succeeding, etc. But also, as you know, under the reign of Basil II, a great reaffirmation of central imperial power. And, of course, this could not uh, prevent uh, the... Uh, the the uh, eventually the the, prevail, uh, the the prevalence of the the private forces that the Komnenoi would, as emperors themselves, fundamentally accept as the they are mounting an ever more feudalizing direction. If you want, even though full feudalism was never a Byzantine thing, as you know, it's interesting to point out that the father of um, of Isaac Komnenos at this point was fighting for Basil. Uh, in uh, during the the campaign against Focus, it was the um, the uh, the the governor of, of the area was besieged by by Focus at some point, um, and um, so you understand the the background where where those men were coming from, also culturally, how deeply intertwined really also the. And, and continuous the, the relations between eventually the Macedonians the Comnenians would, would be uh, and uh, we will hopefully see more of this at some in some other video because about Basil especially there is dramatic I mean uh, about Byzantine history there is so much always to say and to understand in detail but this dynamics looking with with the land through the lenses a bit more in depth just a little more that tells you how how complex the thing was and how easily things could go and of course as always in history in another direction but it's worth reflecting in this sense also why things went the way they did rather than fantasizing on you know uh, imaginary uh, reality um, for today however uh, we stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.